Hey guys, EST here, and why aren't there more videos on this topic? So everybody wants to put solar rays on their house that's hot right now, but you just don't hear about wind. And why is that? I mean, in my home state, there's only one, maybe two solar arrays that I've seen. And then there are a ton of wind turbine farms. And my state's not even that windy. But the question on everybody's mind is, well, the sun's only out for half the day, tops. What about the rest of the time? And when the sun isn't out, it tends to be windy. So why not do both? Well, as I research this topic, there is a lot to it. So solar panels can just have the circuit switched off if need be, if the batteries are full or whatever, and they don't overheat or explode or they don't have to go anywhere with the energy. It basically just doesn't complete the circuit. Now, wind turbines are effectively a fan attached to an alternator. I know it's a little more advanced than that, but when they're moving, that energy is captured and it has to go somewhere. The photons can't just bounce off of like a solar panel and just not push any electrons. That, you know, couple hundred watts on the turbine has to go somewhere. And that's where you run into the problems that, that stop a lot of people running hybrid systems in their tracks. So people say, okay, I've got the solar panels, I've got the charge controller, I've got the batteries, and I've got the like grid scale inverter or whatever. Or at least off grid scale inverter. Well, let's hook up another device that dumps DC energy. That's where you have a problem. The charge controller needs to be a special type of charge controller that can dump off the energy when the batteries are full. Otherwise the turbine will like spin out, explode, overheat, blow up the batteries, um, all kinds of fire melt the wires. I mean, like anything could happen if, if the energy has nowhere to go because the energy will find somewhere to go. So you need a separate charge controller. Now, as far as expense, the solar panels are moderately expensive. The charge controller, it's not too bad. The inverter is usually extremely expensive and the batteries, it depends what you get and how many, but they're pretty pricey too. So depending upon the scale and how many amps it can handle, the charge controller really isn't the most expensive part. So if you were to get a second one, well, now you've got two charge controllers uh, with two BMSs, battery management systems, in theory, charging the battery banks. That's not always a problem. It depends upon like the number of cells, the type of chemistry inside of them. But yeah, it becomes a problem. So the two systems aren't as compatible as let's just throw on another source of, you know, 24 volt power or whatever. Now, when I said earlier about the energy has to go somewhere from a turbine, if the batteries are full, that sounds like a bit of an issue. And people think, well, well, just put it to like a space heater, a heating element, you know, just have it dissipate there, turn it into sound, mechanical motion. Um, no, you don't need a true load. You just send it to ground. And if you're going to say that sounds like an electrical short, yes, that's the point. The actual earth, like the ground, the planet we are standing on can soak up an awful lot of electricity. And because of its charge, it will. So you really just need like the right type of charge controller to do that. There's other equipment that can do it too, but generally that's how people would do it. So that's actually the easy part. Now you can get charge controllers that could take solar and could also take wind at the same time. They're a little bit, you know, less easy to find and a little bit more expensive. So here's the problem. If people dump, you know, 10 grand into a solar setup and then they think, well, let's add wind. Oh, let's just replace our, you know, what couple month old charge controller. No. But if you planned it from the get-go, well, now you're talking, oh, instead of 10, maybe it's 15 grand with the whole, you know, the towers and the turbines and the even more expensive charge controller. Well, now an already expensive project just got more expensive. But if you're willing to do it up front, cool. So adding it after the fact is very difficult. And that's the main reason why you don't tend to see it. So now that the configuration, the equipment, and the slight differences are clear, let's talk about the other pros and cons and when you should or shouldn't do it or would it even work and how much it can generate, all the numbers, the payback, the everything. So small turbines that are like residential application size tend to be about 400 watts up to 20,000 watts. I'm guessing 20,000 is like you own a farm and you're basically putting up one that would be like almost the size of what a utility would put up. But 400 watts, that would be really nice. Think about it. I mean, 400 watts worth of solar is usually four pretty big size panels. But then you got to think about the factor that should be in the back of your mind from the get-go. How much wind? And unfortunately, the answer is typically not enough. In fact, even determining how big to go is incredibly difficult. So let me just run a real quick example by you. Let's say you're putting up a 1,500 watt wind turbine, pretty beefy one. And you live in a home that would need 300 kilowatt hours per month, which is pretty low. I mean, you're almost talking like a cabin, but okay. So if you were to run the whole thing off of one giant turbine, you would need an average of 14 mile an hour or 6.26 meters per second annual average wind speed. So 14 miles an hour average, not, not average during storms, not average at night, average constant. 
Look, we, we got a winter blizzard going on right now. It's like 10 miles an hour on and off with some little more powerful gusts. But if I walk out there, it's not 14 miles an hour constant. But I live in a fairly flat area with trees and other people's houses in the way. If it went up high enough, I kind of wonder. But if you look up just basically like the name of your country and then wind map, so like United States average wind map, there is almost nowhere that gets 14 miles per hour average constant. So you'd either need to live in the absolute ideal place or kind of cheat it a little bit. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, you're looking at like ocean coasts where you get like, you know, the water and then the land temperature difference. Whenever there's a, a temperature difference, that is how wind happens. It moves from a high density to low density. You know, that's, that's just how it works. And then the rotation of the earth and some other factors are a thing. But if you're on the side of a slope going up and you put a, a turbine there, I think it's like two to three times on average. I saw all different numbers, but you know, think about it, 200 to 300% more wind than a flat area on the bottom of the slope. And it'd have to be pretty significant. You'd still have to live in an area that has wind, but on the opposite downward slope that doesn't face into the wind, boy, you're not going to get much. The wind is basically zero because, you know, air doesn't, it isn't heavy enough to like water fall down the slope. So the site location is important, but then the placement of the actual turbine is important as well. And the general guidelines that I was seeing online from multiple sources were um, upwind of buildings and trees, obviously, and uh, just generally 30 feet above anything else, and then 300 feet away from any other obstructions, which is usually your house. Now think about it. 300 feet away from your house and it's generating direct current. Let's talk about that. To save money, unless you just like spending money for the fun of it, you're going to run the thinnest gauge wire that you possibly can because why overspec it? But you may have heard that alternating current is used on the US power grid and pretty much everywhere else in the world because it transmits over long distances like miles and miles a lot easier with less resistance. And it is immensely more efficient. So you need thicker wires if you're going to do direct current. The other thing is you could put the inverter and the charge controller, and then what do you do for batteries? And that's where you run into a problem. All really close to the turbine and then just have the AC go to your house. That's a bad setup for all kinds of reasons, including, of course, like maintenance. And like, do you put it on the base of the pole and how do you waterproof it? Like, it's not impossible. People do it. But man, if I had to send it even a thousand feet, that is so much money in copper. The wiring would just be nuts. And when people price out turbines, they're like, hey, that's not too bad. Oh, and then, then just some wires. That's just wires. I got wires laying around. And then they look up, oh, no, I need like, you know, four gauge wire and I need 500 feet of it. Uh-oh. At today's prices, that probably cost more than the turbine and the tower. Now, getting back to what size you would get and how many, it's just so difficult. You need the average wind speed at your actual site in the actual location. And now if you go under, your batteries run out and you run out of power. If you go over, that's fine. You just dump it off to ground, like I said, you know, just dissipate the energy or put the brakes on, you know, one or two turbines if you got multiple. But then you paid for equipment that you're not using. You're, you're capturing energy that you're not using at all. Now, the other thing is, you know, you could say, hey, this is an 800 watt turbine. Well, that could be max. That could be at like 29.9 miles per hour. Then at 30.1, it hits the brakes. And then in reality, in, you know, 10 mile an hour winds, you're going to get way less watts. So they have this thing called a, a turbine power curve, which is like if it's spinning at this rotational speed or really just if it's spinning because of insert wind speed here, then it creates this much, this much, this much. And remember, uh, if you were to just in a straight line, not rotationally, but it does somewhat translate. If you were to take a bowling ball and accelerate it to 10 miles an hour, that takes X amount of energy. And if you want to accelerate it to double that to 20 miles an hour, it takes four times X amount of energy. It's not double. It doesn't work that way. So... 20 mile an hour wind has far more energy than 10. So even if it's, you know, rotating the uh, turbine at half, which it shouldn't work that way, it's going to be so much less electricity. But then, like I said, you need tower height. You need annual average wind speed at your specific location. You need the frequency distribution of the wind. That is the estimated number of hours that the wind will blow at each speed during the average year. And then adjusted for seasons too, and then compare that to the solar and the sunlight. And, you know, you also need like elevation from sea level, temperature, because thicker wind has more energy. Oh, and cold wind is much more dense, much thicker. But if you just think, you know what, in case something happens, hail comes and breaks all of my solar panels. I want, you know, enough to charge a phone and run one little thing or whatever. I just want to keep the batteries topped off. 
Well, one, keep a spare solar panel inside, duh. And two, if you just want to say, you know what, I just want to get something at night in case, you know, it's rainy the next day or it's cloudy for four days in a row and we run out. Because if it's cloudy out, it's generally windier. It takes a temperature change, generally, to create clouds, and temperature changes create wind. It is a lot more complicated than that, but in general, that's how it works. So if you just added one tiny little turbine and the correct equipment for it, well then, yeah, the amount of money you paid for the charge controller and all that, okay, yeah. But uh, if you effectively went 90% solar, 10% wind, and it's just there, and you've got like maybe two turbines, little tiny one, two, 300 watt ones, or you have the minimum 400 that is average for installs like this, I think that's nice. It's really just simply, oh, more equals better, and then it's just alternate, two sources. And if that's as far as you're going to think about it, I think actually that's pretty decent. So before you get caught up in, oh man, I got to go look up maps and do calculations and put out like calibration equipment and track the wind speed for a year and then, you know, try it in a different location and not necessarily, you can look up historic data pretty accurately, at least for your area or worst case, just kind of anecdotally think, yeah, it's constantly windy here. I'm in an open field. I'm in a slight slope. I'm by a body of water. It is windy. The general number that's thrown out there, and this is going to change, you know, probably by the time I upload the video, but generally... Nine miles an hour average makes it worthwhile to go with wind instead of solar. And once again, nine miles an hour is, is absolutely nowhere, basically, at least not in uh, North America. And that's where you get into like hills and, you know, valleys and all kinds of weird stuff. So once again, there is a reason that people put in solar instead of wind. But this video scope is, hey, what if it's cloudy for two weeks or something? You know, I, I want to diversify and a generator is unreliable, requires fuel and very temporary. But even in really windy places, that's why they recommend hybrid systems, which is, you know, mixing up potentially a generator, a natural gas tank, you know, a thousand gallon tank of propane or something. That's not bad. And then an accompanying generator that'll run on that or a dual fuel one. Those are even nicer. And by the way, I meant to say propane or natural gas. There, there is a difference, obviously. And then also doing solar and then add a little wind to it. Why not? Based on location. Now, here's the thing, though. I don't want to scare you into saying, oh, you're, you're, you know, I can barely afford it. You know, seven, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 setup that you're going to put in. Well, now you have to dump more into it. Oh, you know, fear mongering. But I will tell you that, you know, ask anybody who has a system and tracking and, you know, this nice little like bar graph and all that. Especially in California where it's very sunny but occasionally cloudy, uh, on a cloudy day you're looking at a 50 to 75 percent drop. It's that bad. So like I don't live in a very sunny place. It's very cloudy. We get dynamic weather. It's you know northern United States. So that's the other thing is I'd need like a freeze proof. You know something that goes down to like negative 10, negative 20 Fahrenheit. That's a whole other thing. Then we're talking about maintenance and all that. I mean, it is moving parts and stuff will wear out, but if you get a really good one, which is even more money, it should run for quite a while. Now, the other thing is turbo cheap and just replace it. Well, if there's a grid down thing and you really need power, there's a severe power outage or rolling brownouts because of wonderful political uh, policies. Well, where are you going to get another one? And the answer is just steal an alternator, or borrow or buy or barter, or nobody's going to use it. So acquire an alternator out of something, you know, preferably like a motorcycle instead of, um, you know, like a car, but whatever. I think the one in my car does like 7,000 watts or something. And it spits out 14.1 volts and some of them are self-regulated. Well, how about that? Okay, then just, you know, with some quick welding or some you know, woodworking or really good, you know, rope skills, put together a basic big turbine. You know, you could use chunks of wood and it doesn't have to be like the most rotationally efficient thing ever it's just like oh i took an alternator don't even need a belt just strap the fins right to the dang wheel and out spinning and output and stuff then you just need just the charge controller and a way to get it up pretty high i guess also but just building a tower out of whatever i mean not the hardest thing in the world so I would say that whether you're going to put in wind or not, at least get the right charge controller that's spec'd for it, and then maybe throw in one just, you know, just because, and then with the expandability in the future. It doesn't add that much, and then you don't have to worry about, oh, site surveys, efficiency, payoff periods, and, you know, government uh, subsidies and all that stuff. So a couple little tips at the end here. What if you end up in a spot that you're not familiar with? Well, look for deformed or damaged trees. That is high wind. And I don't just mean like the whole area. I mean on like a slope. If you're like, well, I wonder if this is slopey enough. Just look for a, a difference in all kinds of stuff. You can see slightly more eroded rocks. You can see slightly different soil, different wildlife. Lack of bugs in some cases because they don't like wind. Not always. Depends on the area. But definitely trees with like a slight curve in them. That's huge. That means there's... Ongoing wind, not just individual wind events. 
Now I will say for cheap turbines, you're gonna run into all kinds of problems. Balancing and vibration is huge if it starts spinning off axis, plus uh, damaging the fairly lightweight, usually uh, fins on it. And we're talking about a typical three blade and all that kind of stuff. And then a braking system so it doesn't overspin, you know, that, that costs a little more. And if you don't have it, well, you better just hope the wind doesn't exceed whatever for a couple seconds and just burn it out or destroy everything. But yeah, the exact blade weighting and, and you know, any kind of vibration is going to metal fatigue it and then it'll crack and fall off. And it's just a big, big, big thing, especially on smaller turbines. But you can get ones that rotate slower, like those those upright ones with multiple small, low-radius turbines. Those are kind of cool. There are safer, more stable ones. There are better, more waterproof, and more, you know, everything-proof designs that scale better. And then the thing for installing is, remember, going up a little bit in height gets you a little bit of additional power. Going up a little bit in blade area gets you a lot more energy because it's a square area. It's like the two-dimensional version of the square cube law. So like 20 extra feet in height, okay, cool, you cleared a couple more things and maybe it's a little windier up there, great. But if you double the size of the blades, you get four times the area, uh, of course that's a square, they're a circle, it's not quite that tidy. Actually, relative to itself, it might be exactly four, I didn't feel like doing the math, but you get the basic idea. So a slightly larger set of blades makes an enormous difference. But you can only generate as much energy as the, the wires can handle and the alternator can handle that kind of stuff. If you take one that's specced for a thousand and you put bigger blades on it and it generates above a thousand, it's probably going to burst into flames or melt or something. Nothing good. Nothing good will happen to that. And there are some very poorly designed commercial windmills out there, especially like Chinese import ones in other countries where Europe is like, oh, well, just as good. Just as good, everybody. Oh, they can do it for cheaper. We're just going to buy the cheapest. Uh, if you want to see the pictures, just basically Google um, wind turbine fire. And if you're thinking, wow, those are like couple hundred feet up there and look really expensive. Yes, but they still designed them wrong and they still went with engineers who didn't know what they were doing or bought ones with defects or, you know, bad materials that China lied about. Remember, energy is dangerous. Now, this isn't the spend money or else you peasant, you know, brand princess channel, obviously, if you've seen my other content. But when it comes to this kind of stuff, you know, it's kind of like um, space heaters. Do not get a cheap space heater. Just don't. I just had a cheapo Walmart one, uh, it was about a year and a half year old, uh, just lit on fire right before I was going to go to bed. Well, fire might be a little generous, but it was smoking and the wires were about to catch on fire. So if I would have been in bed, who knows what that would have done. I mean, obviously it lit off my, my smoke alarm pretty quick. How quickly could I have gone to it? What would have done to the floors? So that's something where I just will not buy it secondhand. And the same goes for like, you know, bad brands. I spent a little bit more money for like a GE dehumidifier after my, oh, I don't know, was it Sunbeam or Honeywell or some other moderately okay but not really brand, uh, failed after like one to two years. And uh, this one's been running for four years. There you go, 30 extra bucks. And it wasn't just, oh, I trust GE with my life. No, not these days. But this had good reviews. So before you buy something, you're like, well, that's out of my budget, but this is within my budget. Oh, well, that's the only factor I'm going to consider. No, in this case... You're talking fire, you're talking failure, you're talking power outages, you're talking it falling down and hitting someone, it breaking after a short amount of time and you're out the money before it pays itself off. Like, it's worth it to put in time, effort, and enough resources and a lot of research. And obviously, if you can't have it professionally installed, because we're talking about some mad voltages and wattages here. So that's about it. Hopefully I didn't scare anybody off of it, but um, I'm going to have a really fun video coming up, potentially in a couple days. It's just really, really difficult to film this, of uh, using a wind turbine, among other uh, things, to really quickly uh, charge up your cell phone in case of an emergency. It is going to be by far the coolest video on my channel, hands down. So hit subscribe if you don't want to miss it. Watch for it in the near future. Leave a like if you appreciate the good info in this video, and I'll see you guys next time.